do that. Okay, so what I want to talk about is the realization of fractional charge and uh, fractional statistics in uh, quantized Hall systems. Uh, and um, uh, the outline of my talk is first, I'm going to uh, remind you about the defining properties of integer and fractional quantized Hall states. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about the um, uh, uh, just what I mean by fractional charge and particularly fractional statistics. Uh, talk about how quantum Hall interferometers can be used uh, to be measure uh, fractional statistics and talk about the observation, successful observation of fractional statistics in a very, in a rather recent experiment. And uh, then uh, if I have a little time, I'll talk a little bit also about the, the search for non-abelian statistics. So uh, I to remind you, quantum Hall systems are two-dimensional uh, electron systems uh, studied at, uh, in strong magnetic fields at low temperatures. And there are a large set of peculiar phenomena that occur in these systems. The most dramatic of them are uh, what we call the integer and the fractional quantized Hall effects. And I'll be mostly talking about the, the fractional one. Uh, and these effects were originally studied in, by uh, in, uh, for electrons in, in semiconductor structures, the two-dimensional structures formed by, for example, trapping electrons in a thin layer uh, of gallium arsenide surrounded by barriers made of aluminum uh, gary, gallium arsenide. But also more recently, they've been very extensively studied in graphene and other systems of really two-dimensional uh, layered uh, molecule systems. And the characteristics of a, uh, of a, a quantized Hall state are first of all, that one observes plateaus in the Hall conductance. So over a finite, you, you can vary the magnetic field and the electron density, and over some finite range, the Hall conductance remains absolutely constant. And the longitudinal current conductance actually vanishes, which is another words of saying that is that if I look at the conductivity tensor uh, that describes the current in, in one direction produced uh, uh, by a, a, an electric field in another direction, uh, the longitudinal part, sigma xx, uh, or sigma yy is going to be equal to zero on a plateau, and sigma yx, the Hall conductance, which is sigma yx or minus sigma xy, uh, that's given uh, by uh, a, a, a formula which we can write as nu times e squared over h, where e is the electric charge, h is Planck's constant, and nu is a number which turns out to be either is either an integer or a simple rational fraction. Uh, and uh, uh, that's the quantization, that it's this uh, these discrete numbers. And uh, these results uh, seem to be exact in the limit of t going to zero. There's slight corrections at finite temperatures and in the limit of a, a large sample. Oops, wait a minute. Somehow I'm not, we have a problem here. Well, okay. Uh, now the condition, you can ask under what conditions can you actually see such a uh, an effect, either integer or fractional? So in order for this to happen, you have to be in a situation where in an ideal two-dimensional bulk, far from the edges of the system and the no impurities, let's say, the system would actually have a real energy gap for creation of uh, mobile charges. In the presence of impurities, there can be some localized states in the gap, but the carriers should freeze out into localized states at low temperatures so they don't contribute to the conduction, at least parallel in the direction parallel to an electric field. So therefore, this con conductivity, the longitudinal conductivity can va will vanish at zero temperature. However, it turns out that under certain circumstances, current can flow in a direction perpendicular to the electric field. Uh, it's carried by electrons way below the Fermi surface. And that gives rise to a Hall conductivity. Uh, Hall conductivity is sigma xy is minus sigma yx which uh, it has to be some dimensionless number times e squared over h, which has a dimension of a conductivity. And as I say, it turns out that when this occurs, this nu is uh, one of these, uh, is quantized. It's not just any old number. So 
uh, an important point is that when you're in one of these fractional, uh, one of these quantized whole states, fractional or integer, uh, even though uh, if, if nu is not zero, of course, the, you could always have a situation where nu is zero, then there's no conduction in any direction. That's just an insulator. But in these special cases where nu is non-zero, the energy gap has to vanish uh, along the sample edges, even though there's a gap in the middle of the sample. And uh, these edges uh, uh, form a peculiar type of kind of one-dimensional metal called a chiral metal because over large length scales, charge carriers don't travel in both directions, but they travel only in one direction along the edge. Of course, it's opposite directions on the two edges. Uh, and if you have a ribbon-shaped sample and it's an equilibrium, you have equal currents flowing in the two along the two edges, so there's no net current. But if you produce a chemical potential difference between the two edges, so you have more carriers on one edge than another, then there's gonna be a net current, which is proportional to the chemical potential difference between the edges. And in a, a sample uh, where you uh, produce, run a current through, you can have both an electric field of the bulk and you can have a chemical potential difference along the edges. And it turns out that the total current uh, uh, of course, will be the sum of the edge current and the bulk current, and the voltage difference measured by a voltmeter, which you connect to the two edges, would be the sum of the electrostatic potential difference and the chemical potential difference. And it turns out, uh, basically because of, uh, of current conservation, uh, that the, Hall con the measured Hall conductance, which is your total, the ratio of the the, the current total current flowing in the x direction, let's say, to the voltage drop in the y direction, is independent of any details of how the current is divided between the bulk and the edge, uh, and it's just equal to this quantity nu times d squared over h, which is which we've already talked about. And furthermore, because of conservation of current, it can't change as long as you. Uh, you, you can argue that it cannot change as long as the conductivity, the longitudinal conductivity remains constant in the bulk. And that's sort of why it's quantized. Now, how do you get an energy gap uh, in, uh, in a system such that this nu is different from zero? Of course, you can have an ordinary insulator, then nu is equal to zero, it's not interesting. Well, integer quantized Hall states can occur even for non-interacting electrons, and it's not hard to understand them uh, in the end, the energy gap occurs uh, because when the Fermi level is in an energy gap between uh, two Landau levels, and because of the quantization of energy, that can happen. But for a fractional quantized uh, Hall effect, the Fermi level is inside a Landau level. And if you didn't have electron-electron interactions, the, the system would be just completely degenerate. There'd not be no gap at all. So electron-electron interactions are absolutely essential and not trivial to produce a fractional quantized Hall effect. And it took a while to figure out how that can happen. And uh, the big breakthrough, first breakthrough was Laughlin in 1982, who proposed trial wave functions uh, for uh, uh, the simplest uh, rational fractions, nu equals one third and one fifth. And uh, the trial wave function that he proposed is actually the exact ground state in the limit of short range interactions, but it turns out that has very good overlap with the ground state when you have Coulomb interactions between the electrons as shown by, uh, well, it can't be proved rigorously, but it's shown by numerical calculations that have been carried out on finite systems containing say up to 18 electrons on either a sphere or a torus. And uh, we have really great confidence that this is the correct explanation for, for those states. Now, there are many other fractions that have been seen now, many, uh, maybe a hundred of them, not explained, which many of them are not explained by the Laughlin wave functions. So there have been many other approaches, the composite fermion approach introduced by Jane in 1987 uh, is uh, one of the most important ones. Uh, that applies to states particularly of the form nu is equal to p over 2mp plus 1, where uh, P is an integer, uh, uh, either positive or negative. M is a positive integer. Uh, and examples, not all fractions, these are of course fractions with odd denominators, but not all odd denominators, odd denominator fractions occur this way. Examples are two fifths, three sevenths, four sevenths, five ninths, four sevenths, two thirds. These are all fractions less than one. They're, they're fractions uh, less in the, in the lowest Lando level. Uh, and these were. Hello? 
Yeah. So these were based on uh, trial wave functions, and they agree very well with numerical calculations. And these are these Jane states uh, are indeed the ones most prominently uh, observed in the lowest lambda level. So again, we think we understand these pretty well. Now there are also states in higher lambda levels. They're generally less well understood. There's some uh, debates about them and competing hy hypotheses about them. So those are, you know, those are open questions. But they're not very important for my talk because I don't. I'm not going to be talking about. I'm not going to try to justify why these are the right uh, uh, wave functions. I'm just going to ask you to accept that there are quantized Hall states, and the features that I'm going to talk about are independent of any microscopic details. As long as you have uh, quanti uh, Hall, as long as you have a Hall conductance that's quantized, then what I'm saying has to occur. And in particular. Or the, th the phenomena I want to talk about are fractional charge and fractional statistics. And what I claim is uh, uh, that regardless of any microscopic details, if you have a fractional quantized Hall state, where nu is some fraction, not an integer, then they have to support fraction uh, quasi-particles, the elementary excitation, which have a fractional charge, a charge, a fraction of the electron charge. And these quasi-particles, furthermore, do not behave like ordinary quantum mechanical particles, fermions or bosons, but they exhibit what we call fractional uh, statistics, or they could even exhibit something more complicated, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is called non-abelian statistics. And the theoretical arguments for the existence of quasi-particles with fractional charge and either fractional statistics or non-abelian statistics are really quite rigorous. Uh, you can't, they, they really have to be there if you have these, uh, uh, if you do have fractional quantized Hall states. On the other hand, the fact that they have to be there mathematically doesn't mean that it's so easy to see them uh, uh, experimentally, directly at least. Uh, and especially fractional statistics has proven very hard and only been seen very recently. And I will try to explain why. So first, let me talk about uh, the argument why there have to be fractional charges. Now, this is an argument due to Laughlin. Uh, uh, and, and let's talk about nu equals one third. So suppose I have a, a, a plane with a, a two-dimensional system with uh, conductivity at, at, at nu equals one third, uh, and I insert a, a, an infinite, a, a solenoid, a magnetic solenoid of zero denom, denom, de diameter at the origin, let's say. And then I turn on a current adiabatically until the flux through the solenoid is equal to just one flux quantum, phi naught, which in these units were h bar and units where h bar and e are equal to one, this is just one over two pi. Okay, and now in these units, if I if I turn on uh, well, if I turn on a, a magnetic flux, it's going to produce an azimuthal electromagnetic field, which is uh, given by uh, the energy the the field in the in the azimuthal direction is going to be one over two pi times the distance from the origin times the time derivative d phi dt. And of course, if there's a if there's a, a, a conductivity sigma xy, then that's gonna produce a current in the radial direction. And that, that current will be one in these units, one third over two pi uh, uh, times this uh, one third of e, this uh, electric field over two pi. And if I integrate over time, as I put in one flux quantum uh, and calculate the total current that flows in through some circle of radius two pi r, I find that that's just gonna be exactly equal to minus e over three. So I've, uh, uh, or, or in other words, I've, I've taken out a minus uh, a e over three charge from the, the center and I've left a hole there. And now I can stop changing the flux and I have a Hamiltonian with one flux at the origin. It's physically identical, uh, one flux at the origin and, and I'm in a, in, a, in a time independent state, which is an eigenstate of that Hamiltonian. Now the Hamiltonian with one flux at the uh, uh, at the origin is identical mathematically to the original Hamiltonian after making a gauge transformation. When I multiply, the only difference is the wave functions are multiplied by a phase factor, but they have exactly the same spectrum. So that means that the original Hamiltonian H naught has to have had uh, the possibility of having uh, uh, states with uh, that are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian with charge e or minus e or plus e if I change the the sign of the of the magnetic field. So in this case, there have to be charges of e over three. Now, whoops. Let's see. Now, 
What happens if I look at another fraction like uh, a fraction of P over Q where P over Q are, uh, are um, mutually uh, uh, have no common denominator, then uh, Laughlin's argument would say, if I put a, a flux in, uh, in and turn it on, I'm gonna get a charge at the origin, which is E times P over Q. But I claim this is not the smallest charge, though those charges do exist, but there can always be smaller charges because if P and Q have no common divisor, you can always find integers such that N and N prime, uh, with N and N prime such that N times Q minus N times P is equal to one. And that means that if I take a combination of N electrons with charge E and N prime uh, uh, positive uh, quasi particles with charge uh, P over Q, I'm gonna wind up with something which has a total charge of just E over Q. In other words, I can therefore produce a, a, a composite object which has a, a charge, I can certainly produce a, an, an object which is an eigenstate, which has charge E over Q, where Q is the denominator of what that is. And indeed in the, uh, the, there could be even smaller charges in principle, but there must at least be those charges. And uh, it turns out that okay. Sorry. Hello? See? it turns out that uh, in uh, in the Jane states, these are the smallest charges uh, that exist that that exist in these odd denominator Jane states. But it also turns out that there are in higher there there are also states and uh, that exist which have e even denominator Q. They're more complicated, and I'll say something about them later. Uh, uh, and it's been shown there that in that case there must be uh, not only quasi particles with charge E over Q, but but also with charge E over two Q. Okay. So there must be fractional charge. What about fractional statistics? What, what do we mean by fractional statistics? Well, it turns out that there are a number of different definitions which are equivalent to each other, but they look a little different. Uh, the one I like to talk about is in terms of an effective wave function uh, and an effective Hamiltonian, which we would introduce to try to describe the behavior of a collection of some uh, reasonable number of, of quasi particles uh, these, these are, this is a collective wave function, which we're going to just describe, be a function of the positions of the quasi-particles, and we're going to integrate out or eliminate all the gazillion electrons in the problem. And the effective Hamiltonian uh, that I come up with should describe the energies and eigenstates of, of, mo uh, of, of uh, 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 and the equations of motion of these quasi-particles, assuming that they're free to move. And uh, we have to make that assumption for this definition. So uh, now there are a lot of different ways of defining an effective wave function. In particular, uh, what you can do is uh, you can make a gauge transformation where you multiply the wave function by some phase factor, and then you just have to compensate that by making an equivalent gauge transformation. You introduce some gauge potential in the effective Hamiltonian. And so there are many choices. Uh, and um, the, the choice, one choice you can make uh, 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 if you have some quasi particle with with uh, with fractional statistics, you have some hard choices to make. So if you want to have an effective interaction Hamiltonian that does not contain this gauge interactions, which only has short range interactions, then what you're forced to do is to use a multi-valued wave function. So that means that if you interchange two identical quasi particles, say around a, a, a counterclockwise path, the effective wave function picks up a phase factor e to the i theta that's not one or minus one as it would be for ordinary fermions or bosons, but it's something else. And that means if I move one particle all the way around another, that's equivalent topologically to, to two interchange, interchanging the particles twice, that's going to pick up a phase e to the two i theta. And if i theta e to the i theta is not one, or minus one, then e to the two i theta is not one. And so you don't come back to the same wave function. So you have to get in that case, excuse me, that, that means you have to have a multi-valued wave function. Well, if you don't like working with multi-valued multi wave functions, and I don't like working with them, you can avoid that uh, by introducing, uh, making a gauge transformation, which you get rid of, you multiply by phase factor, which gets rid of the, uh, it's a singular, a gauge transformation gets rid of the, the, the this multi uh, non 
non uh, unitary non unit phase factor uh, and you can do it in such a way as to get either bosonic or fermionic statistics for the wave function but then you have to include in the hamiltonian uh, a long distance interaction via a churn simon by gauge field which is the kind of gauge field that's introduced is called the churn simons gauge field and effectively what this does is it attaches a magnetic flux to each particle uh, uh, this magnetic flux which moves around with a particle has a value of theta over pi where theta is this uh, is the angle that you would have picked up if you were, were using a, a gauge where there wasn't a chain sermons flux so again if you move one particle adiabatically around another you pick up a phase factor of e to the 2i theta which is the same theta as we had before and that's the most useful way to think about it uh, there's another way of thinking about it uh, in terms of a geometric phase uh, which is based not on this effective wave function but on the microscopic wave function for the electronic ground state uh, uh, with taking into account all of the electrons in the system but with several quasi particles uh, uh, present at fixed positions uh, and assuming there's an energy gap to all states you can calculate the geometric phase you accumulate when you interchange two identical quasi particles by moving them around a closed path and um, and you subtract the phase that would have been there if there was only just a single quasi particle and the difference is the statistical phase and it turns out to be the the, the statistical phase you get this way is exactly the same as you would have gotten from this other definition but the other definition is most useful uh, for uh, experiments i mentioned uh, non-abelian statistics that's something that can occur all in certain very special systems uh, what I assumed before is that you had a single non-degenerate ground state that described the system uh, when you specify the position of the quasi-particles. These special uh, fractions where you have non-abelian statistics are such that if I have uh, I have a many degenerate ground state, and particularly if I have n well-separated local quasi-particles in such a state, uh, uh, then I find that there's a degeneracy that grows exponentially with the number of particles n now this degenerate it's not a perfect degeneracy if you have finite separations between the particles the degeneracy is split but the splitting falls off exponentially with the separation so it can be really small if you make the separation large and in that case uh, what happens is that interchanging two identical quasi particles doesn't just produce a phase factor but it produces a whole unitary transformation in this complicated Hilbert space. And if you make multiple interchanges between different quasi particles, uh, uh, the results depend on the order of the interchanges, the way you interchange them, which one's first, which second. And it uh, and that's why it's called non abelian. It, it's all deter it's determined by the topology of the braiding of the world lines uh, and not by any details of how you do it. Uh, it's called so that what, what you wind up is, is a representation of the braid group. Uh, but uh, mostly I will be talking not about these non-abelian statistics. Maybe I'll say something about them at the end, but I'll be talking about uh, the uh, fractional statistics, which is this simpler case that I just mentioned. Now, there's a theorem, which I, I guess I alluded to, that if you have quasi-particles with fractional charge, they must have either fractional or non-abelian statistics. They cannot have just fermionic or bosonic statistics. And it turns out this follows from gauge invariance, and I'm not going to go through the whole details here, but it's somewhat similar to the Laughlin argument for the existence of fractional charge. Uh, and uh, so we know it's there, as I said, but as I said, just because we know it's there mathematically doesn't mean that it's easy to see fractional statistics directly in any kind of uh, experiment. Okay, so how how would you go about trying to see it? So the the um, the, the way. Let's see if we can, I can get that out of the way. This, uh, the way to to see this the the, the 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 way it has been seen is in a uh, interferometer experiment. So this is a sketch of this sort of ideal of this interferometer experiment. I have a quantized Hall system. In this case, it's at nu equals a third. I've indicated it. 
which has um, uh, current co contacts that allow me to send a current, say, from the right end to the left end. Uh, I have uh, to uh, uh, the system is a bulk system, but it has some narrow constrictions at two points. Uh, uh, ignoring these constrictions, I have, of course, these chiral edge currents, which I've shown by the arrows, the direction in which the currents flow. Uh, and in equilibrium, they're, they're equal and opposite. If I flood, flow a not net current through, then there'll be more current along this edge than this edge. There'll be a different voltage on this edge than this edge. Uh, and that would be just a steady state. Uh, and there'd be no dissipation, they would just flow that way. Uh, but if I have these narrow constrictions, I can get, get tunneling from one edge to the other, and the tunneling could cause a, a, a voltage leakage. If I measure the voltage difference between two points, in, in the absence of any um, tunneling, th these voltages would be the same. But if I have tunneling, then I have a voltage law, current loss, voltage loss, and I can measure a voltage difference between these two edges proportional to the current uh, between uh, between between these, uh, there's a voltage difference between the two contacts proportional to the current that leaks the cross here, and these two currents, uh, there could be interference between qu quasi particles that leak across this current, this uh, this constriction and this one, uh, and um, the, the, uh, the uh, and this uh, uh, this quasi particle, uh, the, the, this interference is a signal that we're going to try to measure. It will cause oscillations as a function of parameters. And I want to consider a situation where I also have some localized quasi-particles of charge one third in the middle uh, of this interferometer loop. Okay, and, and now you can try to calculate what would the phase be uh, uh, picked up uh, in this interferometer. What it measures is basically the phase that would be picked up by a quasi-particle that goes around this uh, area here. It's a quasi-particle going around here, uh, and that quasi-particle will pick up a phase. If it's an E over three quasi-particles around, uh, first of all, it'll be a, a pick up a phase due to the magnetic field, which in these units, well, which is in general, this phase is going to be uh, equal to uh, two pi times the magnetic field times the area uh, enclosed by the loop divided by the flux quantum. It's the number of flux quanta, two pi times the number, the phase will be two pi times the number of flux quanta in the air, in the root. This is the flux quantum for an electron. But since the charge is only one third, uh, it will pick up only one third of this charge. That's why this is three in the denominator. And A, A is the area enclosed by the interfering edge state. Uh, but in addition, if there are, are quasi particles in the middle, there's gonna be an extra phase which is uh, uh, minus two times pi over three times n l n sub l is the it, which has to be an integer is the number of localized quasi particles inside the the parameter and pi over three is the exchange phase minus pi over three is the exchange phase that you would get uh, by in exchanging two one over three uh, 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 quasi particles in this case what we're bringing one around the other, that's why you get the minus two, and the, one of them is in the center, or an NL of them were in the center, and one is moving around the edge. Now this AI ideally is just a, some fixed area, but in fact, uh, of course you can vary this area by uh, varying gate voltages that change the area of the uh, 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 occupied by the electrons by repelling them from the edges. You can of course also change B, the magnetic field, uh, and uh, the magnetic field also will have some effect typically on the area enclosed. Uh, but in addition, this area can fluctuate slightly about its nominal value due to Coulomb interactions and thermal excitations. So that complicates the analysis uh, quite a bit. And you, it's, you have to work very hard to try to control these fluctuations. And that's what finally was achieved yeah, uh, in uh, 2020 by Nakamura, Liang, Gardner, and Manfra at Purdue. Uh, and uh, this is the experiment that they did. This is a color plot of the uh, resistance, the, the, the change in resistance. It's just a small change in resistance of a part of uh, a, a change in conductance of the part of about a, a few hundredths of uh, E squared over H. Uh, and uh, what you see is here, here they're varying the magnetic, the, this is varying the gate voltage 
and this is varying the magnetic field on the bottom here. And uh, these stripes you see here, these are lines of constant phase. So you could, if you increase the, the, the voltage, you increase the number of electrons, or, uh, the, or you increase the area, or if you increase the magnetic field, the phase will increase. And so these are spaced, these are phases. This is a phase change of two pi as I go from here to here. These are, uh, as you change the, the color coding tells you the change in the magnetic field in the, in the resistance. And so you see these equally spaced lines, which are spaced by an amount in magnetic field, which indeed corresponds to adding one third, uh, the, the, the spacing you would get for interference of one third quasi particles, one third that confirms the one third charge, if you wish. But in addition, you see these glitches. And you see the glitch here is uh, it, it, the phase jumps by approximately uh, minus a third. Uh, and we associate this with the situation as we change the magnetic field uh, at a certain point, you get an extra quasi particle which jumps into the system. They, it occurs kind of randomly because these uh, you, there are sort of random uh, localized states that become occupied as you change the chemical potential. And each of these jumps produces, uh, uh, you can see the, the, the size of the jumps are minus two, they're all approximately one third within experimental error. Uh, they're, they're, they're pretty close to a third, exactly what you would expect from this picture. Uh, uh, so th this is a, a great confirmation. I should say something about the, the history of the theory. So at first, the idea of, 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 uh, of that fractional statistics could occur in a two-dimensional system dates back to 1977, even before the discovery of the quantized Hall effect. And Wilczek uh, uh, elaborated on this and gave, it, gave these particles the name Enion, which is uh, generally used today, and talked a lot about their general properties. But, but then uh, it was in, in 1984, uh, I and uh, uh, Aravos Schrieffer and Wilczek somewhat independently uh, argued that in fact, the place where, quasi where fractional statistics actually does really occur in nature, and it was not just a mathematical, that it was not just a mathematical uh, possibility consistent with the laws of quantum mechanics, but actually did occur in nature uh, in fractional quantized Hall states. And was, so they really do exist in the real world. That was our argument. And then uh, how to see them, we, we, uh, I think it was understood that interferometry was, was some way of looking at them, a detailed analysis of what interferometry should look like uh, in the fractional quantized Hall effect came into uh, uh, existence uh, in, in a paper by Shamon et al. in 1997. Uh, the complications due to Coulomb interactions and thermal fluctuations that I mentioned on the area fluctuations were taken into account uh, by people, particularly by paper that I wrote with some coworkers in 2011. But uh, as I say, uh, it really took a long time to get good measurements. Uh, why was it so long? Why did it was so difficult? Well, as I sort of indicated, it's really difficult to control these fluctuations of the area. And it's also even more difficult to control the number of quasi particles inside the uh, interferometer area. Quasi particles can be created and, and, uh, uh, and destroyed, uh, or they come from the edge, really. They're, they're created from the edge, or they come in from the outside. And most experiments were done with the interferometer, not in a true gap, but in, in what we call a compressible regime. With the Fermi level, it's it's in it would be in a gap for the ideal system, but it's in a region where there are a lot of localized states uh, uh, due to impurities. So it's not in a true energy gap. And in, in those conditions, it takes rather little energy to introduce a quasi particle or remove it. And so any fluctuates uh, thermally. Uh, and uh, uh, also the Coulomb interactions and uh, can complicate things. And what Nakamura et al. did was to construct a sample where the Coulomb interaction is very well screened and the other properties are very well controlled and they could operate with the, the Fermi level and a true energy gap and a small density of impurity uh, states. And so they could really separate these individual jumps, then you could see them. 
Uh, okay, so let me see. So do I have time to talk, to say a, a bit more about non-abelian statistics or do you want me to stop? I, well, I don't hear anything. Hmm? Uh, Professor Galperin, uh... Uh, and, uh, the time is over, almost over, but if you wish, you can continue just a few minutes. Okay, well, let, <clears throat> let me say that the, the simplest type of non-abelian statistics is called Ising anions. It's a statistics where if you have N quasi-particles, the dimension of the ground state has a dimension two to the N over two. It's pr proposed that uh, the fractional quantized whole state at new equals five halves is of this type. It should have quasi-particles with charge E over four, as we mentioned, which are Ising anions. Um, and uh, what that means is that the interference period as well as the phase depends on the number of anions inside the interferometer. Because if you have an odd number of, of E over four quasi-particles, then if you bring one E over four quasi-particle around the other, are on the edge, it'll change not it'll change the whole quantum state, not just multiply by phase factor. So if you change the quantum state, you're not gonna get an interference signal. So in that case, the interference signal associated with the over four particles is absent. But if there's an even number of quasi particles in the interior, then you see it. So there should be an even and odd alternation in the pattern uh, and uh, there were experiments by Willett and collaborators that show evidence for this even odd alternation uh, at, at five halves, also at seven halves. So there is in these one set of experiments, uh, some evidence for this quasi-particle uh, for, for, for fractional statistics. But there are some important questions about the microscopic details of this, uh, 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 of this system that are not well understood what's going on there. The evidence is also statistical and there could be other explanations. So this is still somewhat controversial, uh, but, uh, and what's also the precise nature of the fractional quantized whole state at new equals five halves is an outstanding puzzle. Uh, numerical results uh, suggest that either it, it's a Fafian state, so-called, which was first, uh, predicted by uh, Moore and Reed in 1991, or the antiparticle, the particle hole conjugate of it, which we call the antifafian, which we realized was a separate uh, quantum, a, a completely separate topologically different state uh, some years later. Uh, uh, but in fact, recent experiments uh, uh, by uh, Banerjee et al., at Heiblin's group seem to indicate that it's some totally different state, not one of these, but something called the pH Fafian, which doesn't come out of any of the numerical calculations. All of these would have the same non-abelian properties, but they have different thermal properties, and uh, it's really a great mystery what's going on. So that is uh, one of the mysteries. And I would therefore just like to conclude by saying there are open problems in quantum hole states, even though the quantum hole systems have been around for some 40 years, in addition to the quantum hole, uh, to the puzzle of at what's going on in five halves, there are a number of outstanding experiments on quantum hole systems in higher lambda levels, particularly in other systems that are poorly understood. There are some fundamental questions that still remain open. There are many practical questions as what happens in particular systems. And uh, non-abelian states more complicated than Ising anions can exist in principle. Uh, they've been proposed to occur at some filling fractions, but uh, whether that's correct uh, is, is not clear. So anyway, I will stop here and, and let me uh, say again, thank you very much for this, uh, uh, being able to give this talk and for this honor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Halperin, for the excellent presentation. Let's thank the speaker. Uh, um, the talk is open for discussion. Uh, uh, please, uh, questions, comments. Sorry for my uh, maybe uh, not so clever question, but uh, that is uh, fractional charge, which is equal to uh, plus minus one third is not unique. Uh, 
there are physically equivalent plenty variants uh, for fractional charges with some conditions, yes? Uh, I'm sorry, what do you mean? Are there other systems other than, than uh, quantum Hall systems? I, I'm not aware of it. If there is, I'd like to know. Uh, as far as I know, only mm -hmm. quantum Hall systems have these uh, quantized fractional charges. Of course, it, it doesn't have to be one third. In the two fifth state, mm -hmm. it, it's one fifth, and it could be one seventh or one or one fourth. And these have been seen experimentally, but but experimentally, as far okay. as I know, only in these systems. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thanks you very much. More questions? No questions. So uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much once more. Professor Halperin, uh, that's a pity that we cannot give